the webinar today. Um, we are going to go over some basics on the M1 system. We're going to tell you, you know, what it is, what it can do for you, features and benefits. We'll also go into the board layout, connections, and conclude with uh, showing you how our programming software works. If you have questions throughout the webinar, please feel free to type those into your questions box in your control panel. We will get to as many of those questions as we can during the webinar. Um, if you have a question that requires a more complicated answer or something we need to look into or we just don't have enough time to get to all the questions, then we will provide answers to those in a follow-up email that you'll get early next week. So please feel free to uh, ask as many questions as you like. Uh, we want to make this beneficial for you. Um, also, we will be recording um, this and, and we'll send you a, a link to this recording and as well as the presentation and some other resources uh, and again you'll get that email follow up next week. So we will go ahead and get started here with basic training. I would like to take just a moment to talk to you about our presenter today. Jonathan Jennings will be presenting and he's spent five years here at Elk in a training and technical sales role so he's very knowledgeable about the M1 product. He is currently the Director of Sales at ESC Central in Birmingham, and uh, so we're just really um, fortunate to have Jonathan with us here today, and uh, Jonathan, I'll let you take it away from here. Well, thank you so much, Amy. Um, it's a pleasure working with Elk Products. I'm, I'm so fortunate to be able to still help them out and work with them. Um, I love the M1. I love everybody at Elk Products, especially doing these webinars. It's just a great way to still be connected with such a great company. So the M1 cross-platform control panel, um, since I've taught a lot of classes over the years, everybody asked me, well, why do you call it a cross-platform panel? And the reason being is, instead of it being a security panel, we're now starting to link a lot of things that we're seeing in the residential and commercial buildings together where we're starting to automate a lot of things. Like now, if you walk into bathrooms, even at fast food places, you're starting to see that the lights are starting being automated just based on motion detectors and things of that nature. Because everybody's trying to, you know, keep cost as low as possible due to competition out in the marketplace, and instead of having all these individual pieces out there, the M1 allows us to connect all of them together and gives the end user one place to go to manage all of this. Instead of knowing, well, if I want to change this particular setup, I need I need to go to this, or if I need to do, um, I need to go change my thermostat. I need to remember how in the world this software piece works. Instead of doing all this, we can do it in, in one manageable location. Another great example of that is when you look at your coffee table and you see that you have three different styles of remotes. You've got one for the TV, one for your cable box or dish box, and then I've got one you know, for the Blu-ray or DVD player. Well, you know, It's all nice and dandy having all those, but it does get confusing after a while, especially if, if you have a friend over and they're trying to work your television. Next thing you know, they've got on channel. 14 and it's snow on there and you're like, dude, what are you doing? So this way it's really easy to be able to, to work all those pieces together. And a lot of this question usually comes up is what can be integrated? Well, if you can see here, we've got this nice list. Um, we'll be getting into some examples of these as we go through the presentation. You know, I've talked a little bit about lighting, climate control, doing some thermostats. Um, we could even do pumps and garage doors, another great example because you know, me, I've left the garage door open on the way to work before. I'm sure we've all done that. But just some really good examples of how we can actually get the panel to actually work for us. Because that's the name of the game is making our lives a little bit easier. Now, this is kind of a brief overview of the panel. We're going to get a little bit more in depth about this. Um, out of the box, the panel is 16 zones. It is expandable up to 208 hardwired inputs. We can go up to 144 of those inputs wirelessly, and we will talk about that a little bit later on in the presentation. Out of the box, it's 13 built um, onboard outputs. It is expandable up to 205 of those. You have eight separate areas, eight accounts, or eight partitions, meaning you can have eight separate account numbers being able to report into a monitoring station. Is the best way to describe that. User codes, that's up to 199. Different people can have access to the panel to arm to disarm, have access only depending on how you want to limit those. And we will, once we get into programming, show you examples of how to do all of that. Um, these are going to be pin numbers that you actually walk up to a keypad itself and punch in the numbers, or they can also be proximity cards or key fobs. And yes, we'll actually get into that too. The panel is capable of doing six arming levels anywhere from stay away, 
stay instant, night instant, um, vacation mode, and I'm missing one, Amy. Night. Night. I, I said night instant, but I didn't say night. <laughs> Another reason why I need Amy on here, because sometimes I get ahead of myself and forget what I've said. Um, so you do have those six arm, different arming levels, and we'll actually show you how you can restrict those, because that can be extremely overwhelming, especially for a new user of a security system. It's, they don't quite understand the difference between night mode and stay mode. So you can actually restrict that and not even give them access to night mode. One of the features that everybody loves about the panel is it does have voice descriptions. So literally, if you open up the front door, you can say the front door is open. Um, certain words are not going to be in there. So if I wanted to wish Amy uh, a happy birthday, for example, the panel is not going to have Amy's name in it. But we can use a household telephone line and record it to 10 recordable custom messages and be able to literally have it say, happy birthday, Amy. The panel, like most, has a built-in astronomical clock. That's going to be able to keep up with the time itself. It's got a 512 event history log that you can see that through any of the keypads at the full display. You can see it through the programming software. And you can also see it through ELK RM, which runs on, on computers located on the network inside where the M1 is located behind a firewall. Now, has anybody who's ever bought a computer, especially with the new iPhone being talked about this week, that it makes everything being obsolete? One of the great features about the M1 panel it is firmware upgradable. So a panel that I've had for five years can still work like a brand new panel that Elk is currently shipping out today because it is firmware upgradable. So the next great company that works with the M1 panel, my old panel can still work with it. So you're not going to be stuck with something that you have to get rid of. Now this is one of the newer products that Elk has brought out is the Navigator keypad. This is a full touchscreen keypad that wires on data bus like a traditional hardware keypad, except it gives it that nice um, LCD look that so many things are now going to around the, ho around the home and commercial businesses, including even um, thermostats are going to this way. It's extremely easy to use. It's very intuitive. You can quickly get to the screen that you want to. It does come with a white bezel, but there are optional other bezels available in black and silver. Other interfaces we have are traditional hardware keypads on the left-hand side of the screen here. You can see there is a wide variety. Um, the largest keypad you see there, the M1KP, you can also order that with a blue um, LCD screen in the background since so many things are going um, blue itself. We had to buy a new alarm clock and it had even blue LCD just to kind of tell you how many of those things are actually going blue instead of, instead of the green. On the right-hand side, we're talking about more devices to be able to have access to the M1 panel to make it easier to use, including tablets, um, smartphones, on um, the computer itself. Um, I know personally me, I used to have my computer fired up every night to be able to play around on the internet, and now with the tablets, are, are so many tablets that are out there, I basically use that. I only use my computer if I really need to uh, to do a lot of things, and, and I'm really starting to use it even less and less because I have a full working uh, keyboard now for my tablet, so it's really becoming, uh, my laptop computer at home is really becoming outdated because I just don't use it like I used to because tablets are really starting to take over and now smartphones are getting even, or you can do even more things with them. So we have any questions so far, Amy? Um, we do have one question, and it was about the, the firmware update and how that's done. Um, you can update the firmware on the M1 using the Elk RP programming software. So the updates themselves are available as downloads from our website, and then you use the Elk RP programming software to apply that change to the particular system. Um, and the software does actually allow you to download those updates right from the application now if you have an internet connection the Elk RP software can go out and see if there's any updates available and present the, a list of those to you to let you choose which ones you want to download so you don't even need to actually go to the website to get firmware updates anymore as long as you have Elk RP and an internet connection you can do that without having to go to the website and log in so that's convenient. Great question. Now a new product if you haven't seen 
one of the press releases that came out from Elk. So those email updates are always great to get. So please go ahead and sign up for those. There's always some valuable information coming out from Elk of new products that they're actually working with. And one of them is the M1 to go, which this is going to allow you to control your M1 from a PC from anywhere in the world. Um, before this, you could you could do it, but you were having to come through um, your firewall. And, and basically landing on the M1 XEP, the Ethernet module itself, and you had to open up some ports, and, and it could be cumbersome. I remember the first time I tried to do it at my house, you know, it was it was a little frustrating. So I, I got the port number off by one, and I, you know, I was just making stupid little silly mistakes, but you know how frustrating that can actually be. And this one will now allow you to much easier connect to um, your panel yes. and be able to make those changes. So just to kind of give you an idea of, of what this is and, and you know, but we, we have like the Java app that's built onto the M1 XCP that allows you to, you know, interface with the system. It required several ports, as Jonathan was saying, you know, port forwarding could be kind of a nightmare for you and um, one of the ports that you used, you know, may be used by other devices and that sort of thing. So this simplifies that quite a bit. Um, it offers some features that that Java page did not have as far as like being able to view the event log and save that, stuff like that, custom settings, that sort of thing. Um, one of the really nice things that I like about this software, um, it uses an encrypted port so it's very secure, but you can also load it onto a, a like a USB type drive and take it with you. It's portable. Um, so it'll run right off of a USB flash drive. You don't have to have it installed on the PC. Um, so you can have that, you know, carry it around with you, use it wherever you wherever you go. So it's a, a really nice application and you know, to, to top it all off, it's a free download. So go download it and check it out. I think you'll be pleasantly surprised with what we've done with this software. And how can you go wrong with a price like free? Now, another brand new product available from Elk is their two-way wireless product. Now, Amy, I'm going to go ahead and let you talk about this since you know a little bit more than me. I'm going to go ahead and give you some props there today. Okay. Yeah, we have uh, released our new two-way wireless product. Um, the items that you see on the screen here, those are the items that are part of that initial release. So we've got a key fob, some um, you know, door window sensor, a mini window sensor, a universal sensor, and then, of course, the, uh, the transceiver to connect that to the M1. Um, the nice thing about this with the two-way communication, um, you're getting that acknowledgement that the signal's been received, um, which you know just makes things work a little bit better, and you also don't have a, you know a transmitter that's just blasting out a bunch of signals, hoping that it gets to the receiver. Uh, with this technology, we know that that signal has gotten there because it's been acknowledged, which again is is good for functionality as well as saving um, you know the battery when you're not blasting out um, a bunch of signals like that. So uh, the the two-way key fob is a really great thing. I mean, I think a lot of customers are really going to appreciate that because you, you have an inquiry button so that you can see is the system armed, is it disarmed. You also get that LED status feedback when you press the button to arm the system and you see that red light come on. That means the system armed. That doesn't mean that the key fob transmitted the signal. That means that it, what you wanted to happen actually happened. So you, again, it's just that level of confidence of knowing that it works, um, that it's done what you wanted it to do. So that's something new that we've come out with. Um, you know, if, if you haven't uh, heard of that or, or you're interested in that, there's some more information on our website and we're also running an introductory special through the end of the month, so definitely take a look at that on our website, elkproducts.com. Let me uh, go ahead and address a couple of questions that have come in um, before we get too much further ahead. Um, there was a question about an iPhone app. Um, there is an iPhone app available called eKeypad um, that works on the iPhone and the iPad. You can find more information on our partner page. Um, you know, Jonathan's got the partner page up now. Um, but on our website, you can find you know a link to get you more information on the different versions of the eKeypad that are available for the iPhone and the iPad platform. Um, as far as the wireless goes, and I, I should have went ahead and addressed this because I know it's going to be a question a lot of people have. Um, we currently do not have a 
motion detector or a glass break or smoke out. You know, we, we've got these few items that you saw on the screen before. Um, we are working on adding to this line. Um, we, we know we need to add more sensors to it for it to be a complete solution for you for wireless. Um, those things are in development and will be um, released as soon as we have those available. Um, right now what I'm hearing is, um, you know, Q1 for a motion detector. Um, and, you know, we'll just continue to release those products throughout you know, 2013 as they as they become available. But right now, I don't have any hard release dates on any of those things. But just know that we're working on them and they are coming. I'm glad to see some good questions starting to come in. Now, here's the integration partners page, and this is just kind of a summary of all the different products the M1 actually does work with. So you can see we're talking about anywhere from lining control partners. To, um, Yale locks. If you want to go ahead and, and remotely um, unlock the door, it's a great example if somebody needs to go in and check on your house while you're at vacation, or the neighbor just needs to drop off the mail, you can easily do that. I can say that because if you've been gone for you know four or five days and you come home, your next door neighbor's got this huge thing of mail, which I'm sure all of us has, has happened to. And now we're going to kind of change gears here. We'll talk about the M1 panel layout and the operation of each of the things on the panel itself. And this is going to be a lot bigger view than what we had at the beginning of the slideshow. There's some things I'd like to point out. We are going to take time to talk about each side of the board itself and into greater detail. This is just going to give you an overview. But one thing I'd like to make a big point here is the serial number. And if you look at the bottom of the M1 panel itself to the right of the battery leads, you can see the nice serial number is going to be located right there on a sticker. It's going to be an eight-digit code. It's going to start off with a couple of zeros. And we're actually going to need that information for later on in the presentation when we actually start messing around with the programming software. So I do like to make a big point of where you actually get that information from. Now on the left side of the board is all about our zone inputs. This is where we're actually going to hardwire our zones. So like zone one, almost everybody likes to make this be the front door. So we're going to wire that in. Um, default, the panel is going to be end line, supervised with the resistor sitting out there with the contact itself. We can actually program that differently. We will get into to show you how to do that. Zone one and two are going to share a common. It's going to be um, normally supervised with a 2.2K ohm resistor. Those are going to come with the panel itself. As we come down the, the board here, we're going to get down to the last zone, which is going to be zone 16. This can be a normal zone and work like the other 15 zones. There's nothing wrong with that. That's happy to do it. And right below that, there's going to be a little jumper. So in case, instead of making this be a normal zone, we can actually move that jumper over. And this is going to be where we can actually wire up two-wire smoke detectors on zone 16. Now, we can have up to 20 of those two-wire smoke detectors be on that particular zone with an 820 ohm resistor. And yes, that comes with the, uh, the resistor packet itself too. I know we get a lot of questions about that. Moving on down with the left hand side of the connections of the board. And one thing I, I didn't make a, a point of, and I guess I need to now, um, these are terminal blocks. So in case something horrible happens, um, like if you had water damage or water came down a wall and, and shortened out the board itself, um, what you can actually do, and the reason I say that is because it happened to a neighbor of ours in the neighborhood, um, you can make a, a panel swap extremely easy because all you have to do is pull off the terminal blocks themselves, um, put the new panel in, and then press the terminal blocks back into the panel itself. So it does make swapping out a panel extremely easy, and it's one of the really nice features of the M1 itself. Now we're going to be talking about the power. This is where we have our auxiliary power and also our transformer is going to wire into the panel. If you do buy the M1 panel and a kit, you are going to get an Elk TRG1640 transformer, uh, a great transformer itself. It does not have a fuse. Instead, it has a, a PTC in it. So in case you do short it out, it's going to come right back to life for you. We're going to make that connection right above the master power switch. And above those type of connections are our auxiliary output. Those are 12 volt outputs. And we're going to get all the way up to the top there. And you see the top one does have something different. It's actually a switchable 12 volt power supply, which is a great place uh, to wire up your four wire smoke detectors. So you can actually easily reset those off the board itself instead of going back and 
and wiring up a, an entire separate relay on something and triggering it. We can actually do that built on the board itself. Now we are going to go ahead and turn that board to the right hand side and talk about all the right hand side connections. And first of all, we're going to talk about the telephone. Now the M1 panel can wire into a traditional telephone and it, with an RJ set block, you will actually get one of those with the kit itself. And also with the kit, you're actually going to wire in um, an Elk 952. Now these are absolutely free of charge built in the kit itself. This is a search for sector for the telephone line. And you're going to need, I think, if my memory serves me correctly, I think it's six feet in between the surge protector and the panel itself. Am I right, Amy? Yes. Good. I don't want to be giving out wrong advice. It's never a good sign. Um, that's going to go in between the two. It's RJ40, um, excuse me, RJ35, RJ11 connection, excuse me. All the numbers are getting jumbled up in my head on a fun day Friday. Um, so what you can do is if this surge protector actually does its job, you can actually bypass it extremely easy since it is RJ11 connections and just connect it into it a telephone jack until it's more convenient for you to get out there. Because basically what's going to happen is if the surge protector does its job, then the panel's no longer going to be able to communicate um, anywhere because it's no longer going to be connected to the telephone line. And you know thunderstorms always happen, usually <laughs> nice early in the morning or late afternoon where it's hard to get a tech on site to be able to do that. Let's address a couple of questions right quick. Um, one that we pretty much always get because it's a, a major concern at this particular point for for a lot of alarm installers. Is, um, but what about customers that don't have a standard phone line? Um, you know, they there are different things that you can do for that. I mean, we've had mixed results as far as a, a digital phone line or a voice over IP line. Um, some people have gotten that to work without any problems. Other people have run into issues, and there's there's not really anything that we've been able to pinpoint. You know, it varies by service and region. The uh, only way to know if it's going to work is to try it. But if it if you have this situation, you have alternatives other than using a phone line for your monitoring. You can use a, a cellular type unit. Um, we work with the Uplink and the AES as well as some other dial capture devices like the Telguard. Um, you've also got the IP option if you have the M1XEP installed. You can set up the um, M1 XEP to send their reports to your monitoring station over IP. They would need to have a, a SureGuard or um, OH2000E receiver in order to support that. But um, you know those are those are two pretty popular receivers, especially the SureGuard. So um, that gives you a lot of options there. Um, you know between doing cellular or IP as opposed to a phone line and so that that's the kind of alternatives that you'll want to look into if you're in that situation. Um, had some other questions here. Um, had a question about DSC security products. Um, you know as far as wireless is concerned we don't support DSC. Um, we have receivers that work with GE as well as Honeywell um, and then we also have our own two-way wireless. Um, so those are your wireless options. Um, we don't work with DSC wireless. Um, you, as far as two wire smoke detectors are concerned, they can only be on zone 16, and you can have a maximum of 20. And, and you know that there are a list of supported smoke detectors in the manual, so you want to take a look at that if uh, if you have any questions about what kind of smoke detectors are supported. And again, it's the two wire that we're specific about. The four wire smoke detectors, uh, you know, pretty much any four wire smoke detector will work just fine. One other question I want to answer and then we'll move on here. Um, as far as, far as uh, current available from the panel, um, Jonathan was going over the auxiliary power connections. Um, the panel is capable of providing uh, around one amp of continuous current. Um, that includes the auxiliary power terminals as well as the data bus and other outputs on the board that are supplying power. So you don't want to exceed one amp from the panel. We do offer a supervised power supply, which is the P212S. Um, that is supervised by the M1 over the data bus. And that's a 2 amp power supply, so if you do have a system that requires um, more than 1 amp of continuous current, you can add that supervised power supply and get some extra power from that. 
requires a lot of connections, a lot of questions, excuse me. Um, I probably should have taken a little bit more time and talked about the telephone line itself because that, that is a, a huge thing for most um, security dealers depending on, um, since I live in Alabama, half the tornadoes came through in April, it was a really big ordeal because um, a, a lot of the, the POTS line transmissions just went away coming out of Tuscaloosa. So we do see that. If you guys have questions about that type of stuff, um, I'll be happy to address those at all since I do work for a monitoring station. I'm not trying to persuade you to do business with me, but I'm just happy to help out anybody in the industry that's that's having questions or concerns about that because it, it, it is coming up a, a lot. There are a lot of GSM universal communicators out there that give the give panels a basically the, the line voltage that they're looking for to be happy. Almost every manufacturer of GSMs actually has one. And if you're interested in um, talking with Jonathan about that, we'll, we'll supply you a way to get in touch with him in the follow-up email. We'll give you some contact information in case you want to discuss that with him. Well, thank you, Amy. Thank you. But I guess we've got to get back on track, right? Yes, we do. Um, the main serial port. This is the serial port that we're going to use to be able to program the panel itself. It is a 232 port. Or this is where the M1 XEP, the Ethernet module, is going to connect to or some third-party software. And we've actually got a list there in parentheses. No reason for me to go ahead and repeat that. But we can talk a little bit about the Ethernet module. Now, the great feature about the Ethernet module is it does allow the panel to be on the local area network, and you can access it off-site over the World Wide Web, especially that new M1 to go to be able to access the panel and make certain changes, um, like the M1 to go to upload the event log. That's a huge feature right there especially if it's in a commercial building and you just got an email or a text message that the system was disarmed on Saturday evening. It's like, man, we're closed over the weekend. Who was in it? You know, Who's doing this? So you can actually go ahead and pull up that event log to find out who did it. Outputs. Um, earlier I did talk about the M1 panel has 13 built outputs for you. Output 1 is going to be the voice and siren outputs. That's where the panel is literally going to speak. The front door is open. Output 2, and the little red arrow is going to move up here, is our supervised siren output. Now it is supervised, so you, in case you're not going to use it or anything like that, you do need to put that 2.2K ohm resistor across it. Otherwise, the keypads are going to come up and say um, output 2 trouble because it is a supervised output there. You can also program this to be a voltage output if needed to be. And then our general purpose relay there, our dry contact relay is going to be an output 3. So you can basically wire up anything you possibly want to using that output, whether you want to um, be able to have a momentary closure to control your garage door, you know, open or close it with that momentary closure. If you want to use an actuator arm since Halloween is coming up and you want to have a ghost fall down from a tree or something like that to scare the kids. Um, if you want to do like uh, window shades, another great example. If you're using for an access control, you want to be able to control the, the mag lock or the door strike using the relay. There's just all kinds of possibilities you have using a general purpose relay. Now we're going to have we're basically where a ribbon cable is going to be able to connect on to the panel. And that's going to give you 12 volts, 50 million outputs on outputs 7 through 16. Now, in case you need more relays, because I just gave you a huge bag of examples of what you'd want to use a relay for, one relay built on the board is not going to do that for you. With the M1, you do have a relay-specific only board, an M1RB, that can take 9 through 16 and turn those into relay outputs. So now we can start controlling a lot of things. So now you can have multiple ghosts drop down from trees if you wanted to. Now, I've saved the best for last, if you want to look at it that way, or one of the best ways to confuse people, is the RS-485 data bus connection. Now, this is where all the keypads are going to wire to. The input expanders, which would be the M1 XINs, um, also any wireless receivers that you're going to have out there are going to wire into this thing. The output expanders are going to wire here. The serial port expanders, those are going to be used for like lighting control or thermostat control. You'll need one for, for each one of those. Um, the supervised power supply that Navy just spoke of earlier. Um, the access module. 
All these are going to wire onto the data bus. Now the big thing here, and the thing that I made the biggest mistake of when I first went to work for Elk and messing around with my first M1, was I didn't look at the instruction manual, and I wired up my data bus wrong. And then I asked uh, one of the tech support people, why was I getting communication errors on my keypad? Why do we keep saying uh, lost comm? And it was really funny. Um, I came over and looked at it and looked at my wiring and said, uh, you didn't look at the manual, did you? I said, no. He goes, go look at the manual. So it was kind of an eye-opener. And the reason being is you can only have two home runs connected to this 45 data bus. So of all the devices out there, we can only have two home runs connected to it. So you have to start daisy-chaining things together, if you want to call it that way. And the best way, instead of me sitting here talking about it, is, of course, to bring up a picture. So here you can actually see that I've got some four conductor wire here. We've got four devices. We're going to kind of show you exactly how we're going to wire in. Now to me, I view this as uh, I'm going into something and then coming back out and going to my next device is the easiest way of, of my mind basically accepting what this daisy chaining basically is. Now on the last device here, on both of these home runs, we actually do put a terminating jumper at the end of these devices themselves. Now, a lot of people are actually getting away from four conductor wire and are starting to use like CAT5 or CAT6 type wire since the price has come down on it. And it also makes for a little bit um, cleaner uh, installation, at least especially in the can itself because you've got all these wires coming down together. And we are starting to use those six conductor wires out of it. And we're basically tying in those data connections and going to each de device. And again, the last device on that home run it's going to have to have that terminating jumper. And basically that terminating jumper just tells the panel, hey, don't look for any devices beyond me. This is the, I'm the last stop, I guess. Come to the end of the road. <laughs> exactly. Now, the good people at Elk have made this a lot easier for you because they made data bus hubs. Because, you know, it's funny, when I talk about daisy chaining and stuff, the younger guys getting into this are like, what? What are you talking about? You know, like, why can't we just home run everything? Just run the device, run the wires out to the input devices and output devices, and then I just want to bring them into the can and go straight to the panel. Well, with the M1, you, you can't do that. You are going to have problems if you do. Trust me, I'm a prime example because I did it. And I don't want you to make the same mistake I did. But they came out with these data bus hub modules to make your life a lot easier. So if we are using like Cat5 type wire, you're going to home run everything. It's great. It's exactly what I wanted to do. I'm going to bring all those wires into the can. I'm going to put an RJ45 on them. I'm then going to plug them in the data bus hub, and the data bus hub is actually going to do this for me. It's going to do that crazy daisy chaining wiring for me. And it's also going to come with an RJ45 resistor in it. I'm going to put that in the um, first available open slot. So right here, this is actually going in slot 5, because it's basically going to tell, hey, don't look for any devices beyond me. It's going to take care of the wiring for you, and you're done. For troubleshooting, this is going to be extremely easy for you. Um, I live in a newer neighborhood, and we actually did get it. So got like a couple of mice got up in the attic and it chewed through some wires, so we actually did have some wiring problems. And it can make your life really easy if you can easily troubleshoot my disconnect. Connecting, connecting in a good keypad that you know works into that slot and see if it works. Oh, yeah, a keypad works here. Well, then I know I've got a wiring issue somewhere. So where do I need to go start tracing? So for me, I knew I was good at the, at the panel, and I knew I was good at the keypad because I could see the wiring on the keypad, so I knew it had to be in between the two places. So at least I, I knew of a starting point to start looking for. And as soon as I got in the attic, then I realized what was going on. Now that is for um, basically using CAD5 wire, but still a lot of people still use uh, the traditional 4 wire. And there's nothing wrong with using traditional 4 wire. You know, I was working uh, one time uh, at a distributor. I was there teaching a class, and somebody was like, well, you know, does anybody ever still buy that wire? Of course they still buy that wire, you know. Still make tons of it. This hub we call the retrofit hub, the M1 DBHR, and it is a hub that you can actually go out. Um, this actually needs to be located um, close to the panel itself. I like to install it at the panel in the structure can, especially for a larger installation. Go ahead and get the bigger can and put it in there. You don't want to put this far away. This is more of an active type hub itself. And we actually can wire on to those um, 
branches and really start breaking this thing out. Um, this is a, a great hub for later on if you're going to put addition onto the house and you need to put a bunch of, I need a keypad there and I need the zone put expander out there. Well, I can just run some wire straight out there and then start branching it off at that particular site. And this is a great hub to do it because it's also going to allow your data home run to be a lot longer. Does that make any sense for anybody? Did I confuse anybody? I think you did a good job explaining it. Um, one thing that I would want to point out, um, when you're using the RJ45 style hub, um, it is passive. It's just making the daisy chain connections for you, as Jonathan explained. Um, because you're using um, two conductors per data line, and the data line is basically going to the device and then coming back to the hub, um, you have to count those runs as round trip. So there and back when you're totaling how, how you know, your da total data bus wiring. Um, the data bus wiring cannot exceed 4,000 feet. Um, so when you're using that hub, you have to count each one as round trips. So that does, uh, you know, effectively cut that in half. Um, something to keep in mind. The DBH, um, the RJ45 style hub, can be remotely located from the control. So that can be a benefit in some cases, just depending on your installation. Um, the DBHR that we're looking at on the screen here, it has to be connect cl close to the control, as Jonathan said. Um, but because it is an active hub, it has active RS45 circuitry on it, each branch is kind of like a, a mini M1 data bus. So it follows the same guidelines, two home runs, two termination points and 4,000 feet total from that branch. So um, even though it has to be close to the control and you can't remotely locate it, you can have much longer wire runs on each branch. So you know, just some um, pros and cons of each one that you'll want to consider when you're picking which hub you want to use for your installation. Um, and it is okay to use a combination of these hubs um, in the proper configurations. Um, meaning you can't have a DBHR coming off of a branch on another DBHR and you can still only have two runs going to the panel. Um, you know, there's some um, guidelines that you would want to follow there. Um, so let's see, we have a couple questions here while, I, while I'm already interrupting Jonathan. I'll go ahead and address a few of those. Um, the RJ45 wiring standard that we use for the M1 DBH is the 568A standard. Um, so that's how you're going to want to terminate that RJ45. I um, had a couple of questions about output 1, which is the speaker um, voice output for the system. Um, that is using an onboard um, voice driver to provide the voice announcements. It also provides siren sounds during alarm from output 1. Um, so that's for speakers only. You could um, have multiple speakers connected to that output. You need to keep the load between 4 and 16 ohms. So if we're talking about 8 ohm speakers, you could have 8. Um, you'd have them, you know, sets wired in series and then parallel your sets. Um, if you have the SP12F, which is a 32 ohm speaker, then you could just parallel eight of those right to output one. But eight ohm speakers, you will have to do some series parallel combination wiring there. Um, it, the board has an, a 24 watt audio amplifier on board, and you have adjustable volume control there, so you really don't need any kind of outside amplifier for that. Um, had another question here related to um, outside access to the system from a network. Um, I don't want to spend a great deal of our time on this basic training going into that. I, I will tell you that there's some information on our website that can clarify that for you, but what you may want to do is go ahead and sign up for our webinar that we're having at the end of the month, and that's going to be on September 28th, and that is going to be an IP guide webinar. So we're going to go over the IP features of the M1, what they are, how they work, and give you some um, tips on setting that stuff up. So look on the website for help there and, and also sign up for our webinar on the 28th. You know the nice feature about you answering questions, it gives me a break, Amy, and then I have to hear my voice the whole time. Well, I'm glad I could do that for you. <laughs> <laughs> now, this page is a great overview of how complicated, I guess, is one way of looking at it, or how easy the system can be expanded to. So if you have a system already out there, and you can actually go back to that customer and say, hey, did you know we can do this? And, or did you know your panel's capable of doing this? And it, it's another way of getting your foot back in the door uh, to, to do an upsell of a customer that's already happy with you. 
But you can see how the, this thing really starts expanding out. We've got some data bus hubs here, kind of in the middle of the screen. And you can see here we've got some keypads, we've got an access module, some serial port expanders, we've got another data bus hub, we're talking about a keypad, a zone input expander, and we're really starting to expand just basically what that panel is handling on that data bus that we just spent that time doing. We've got some indoor and outdoor sirens connected to it, you've got the Ethernet module, the M1XEP connected to the local area network in the house, now we're connecting to it with different ways through the touch screen, through a computer. Um, you know, if you have Wi-Fi in the house and you can connect it to it with your tablet to be able to control it, there's just all types of things this panel is capable of doing. Um, Amy will be following up and giving you this PDF document, so you'll have it for your records or your reference to later on. So now we're going to go ahead and switch gears and start talking about the fun of the, the panel itself and basically how to program it. You know, we talked about all the features where you make connections. Now let's kind of get into the fun stuff. Whoops. Okay, before we get too much farther into, and when we start with the RP, I do want to address one more question about the data bus, and I'm really glad to see these questions coming in. This is one of the parts of the system that can be a little bit more confusing. Um, so looking here at this diagram for the M1DBH, um, again, each branch is like a small data bus, so to speak. It, it, it needs to have two termination points. So you see for a branch like branch one where you only have one device connected to the branch, you're going to put a terminating jumper on that keypad and you're also going to put a terminating jumper on JP2 um, to terminate branch one. Now looking here at branch two that has two devices connected to it, you're going to terminate the two devices and you would not have the jumper on JP3. And um, JP5 is, is similar, or excuse me, JP branch 3 for JP4 here, you wouldn't have it on because you have two runs. Even though these have multiple devices, you terminate the devices that are at the end of each run. So with this particular hub, you're doing a lot of termination. You're terminating, you know, devices on the branches. You may be putting termination uh, jumpers on the hub for the branches just depending on your wire, wiring configuration but again each branch is looking for two termination points so that's kind of the guideline to go go by there um, so I just wanted to go back over that because we did have some questions about that and again if you have other questions or you just need some help when you're doing the installation um, just just let us know so now we're going to jump into the elk rp software and this software is available for download on our website, elkproducts.com. You do have to have a login to get to the support section where you download this software. So if you haven't requested one, go ahead and do that. And uh, Jonathan, how much does this software cost a person? Oh, it's the greatest price in the world. It's absolutely free. Oh, we so like why would you that. go ahead and download it and play with it? It's the great way to learn. At least that's the way I learn is messing with stuff. So, we got our panel, you know, we're talking about this, it's time to program it. You could do almost all of the programming through the keypad, there are certain parts that you can't do, like giving out voice descriptions, um, you can't do through the keypad, and you can't do any of the automations or programming through the keypad, but the other stuff um, you absolutely can't do itself. So, so we've got a brand new panel. Let's go ahead and start making a new account. So we're going to go ahead and left click on new. It's going to bring up this nice little box here. And the account ID. Well, I need to name this something. So this could be like, you know, for us, we could call this uh, a, a trainer panel. Um, you can actually call this the name of the customer you're putting in there. Um, so we could call this one Amy's home, for instance, could be a name of the account itself, and it's actually going to show up under the account idea over here on the left-hand side of the screen here. Now, the serial number, I mentioned where to find this. It's going to be to the right of those battery leads. It's going to start off with a couple of zeros. So mine, I'm just going to make it kind of real nice and easy there. Easily made that a digits long. Um, this number, the serial number, and the RP access code must match in order to allow the software to be able to connect the panel. The default RP access code is 246801. This is all out of the box. It's actually located in the instruction manuals itself. And then we're going to talk about what to make. Do we want to create a default account or would we like to copy one? 
an account that we've already set up. So if you're always going to know basic information about your your panels that you're installing, like um, all the central station information, you know, you, the, the number you're automatically going to be calling the 800 number, um, what format you're going to be using, if the front door is always going to be on zone one, you know, you can go ahead and pre-program all this stuff into the panel, and then just copy out of it to save yourself some programming time. But for us, I'm going to create a default account for us. 5 Series Firmware is the firmware that all the panels are currently shipping with out of Elk, so we're going to leave that at 5. And we're going to go ahead and click OK. And that's going to bring us up to the Account Details page. You can see here it's it's probably being built on your computers all over the place. You can see here we got the name and address. We can put Amy's home in there, and her address is, I don't know, 123 Easy Street. That's where you now live, Amy. It's oh, not so on easy street. <laughs> I'm living in North Carolina. Now we can put this in a folder if we want to, or we can make a new folder. So if there's a subdivision that's getting a lot of M1s, you can name it that subdivision, and then you can go find those particular customers and the software under that subdivision name. You can even make notes in here if we want to about Amy's house, like. Um, And I gotta learn to use the space bar. You know, certain customers always want you to take your shoes off so you're not tracking, you know, dirt into their house, so we can make a nice little friendly reminder about that. On the right hand side we've got stuff about the system itself. Um the firmware version, it's kind of guessing at that since we have it connected to it. Of course the hardware bootware version have been loaded, the date that we've actually installed this panel or started working on it. There's our serial number. And there's our RP access code in case we did want to change it. And what you'll do is if you change it, you'll need to save it and send it to the panel, the new code that you actually want to use there. So we've made some changes here because we typed in all this information. You can see we've actually got a little modified light down here, and it's yellow. I'm going to make some more changes before we save that. So right now we're going to go ahead and jump into Users. I'm going to go ahead and expand this out under the folder items here. We'll type on User 1. It comes up as user one, but that doesn't make any sense to me. That would be better off if that was Amy. Or I'm respelling your name there, Amy. So there we go. We've got Amy. And currently you're the master code. And she's the master code because master is actually checked down here. And her code is currently 3456. Is that code okay with you, Amy? No, I don't like that code. Um, but I don't really care what code you give me. Just pick something different. Make something up. Okay. We'll be happy to make something up for you. Now, since the customer is always correct, and I don't want to give my customers all the same number all the time, the software will actually generate a number for us. So we just left click on that. You can see it's actually doing making some changes. So currently it's 6145. That's your current code. She's going to be happy with that because she said she didn't care about it. So there, we've got Amy's got a new code. Again, she's the master. Oven, her code's going to work in all eight areas or eight partitions of the panel itself. But it only has one user and we need some more users. So I'm going to go up here and I'm going to left click on users. Which basically, it's just going to highlight it for us. I'm going to right click. It's going to bring me up a new box here, new user. I'm going to left click that. And then it's going to ask me, hey, how many users do you want to create? Well, let's create four more users. That'll give us a total of five. The next available slot to use is slot 2. We can change this if we want to. I'm going to be lazy and just leave it at 2 and click OK. And then it's going to ask us, hey, do you want to copy from a user or do you want to make custom values? Now what we could do is if we were going to be in a commercial building, let's say had 30 employees, and some people just wanted to be able to disarm the panel and have access, we can make one and then copy out of that same person for the other 10 people if we wanted to. But for me, I'm going to make them all custom because Amy is the master code, and I don't want to have a bunch of master codes running around. So I've got user two here. Well, let's say I can be this one. Be um, I don't know your friend Sam. That's going to come over and take care of your house when you're on vacation, Amy. Okay. All right. And Sam, we're just going to give Sam a random code here. And we're not going to allow Sam to bypass anything because he's a guest and we don't want him to have that type of access. And we don't want him to see menus 1 through 5. We just want to give him just strictly arm disarm and his code can only work in area 1. A good example there. 
And you see how much yellow I've actually changed on this one, so I need to go up here and save it. And now we've saved all the information I've been changing, and the yellow drops out. But now I'm going to go down here and make user number three for you, Amy, because I know what you want. Remembering codes is a hassle. Is there not <laughs> another way? Yeah, I figured you'd want that. So Amy would like to have a proximity card or a key fob to be able to use. So I'm going to go ahead and left-click on that and let Amy explain all. Okay, so we have built into the LCRP software a code calculator here. Um, this, when Jonathan checks this box, he, you'll notice the user code field got a lot bigger. Um, you can go here and enter your site code, your card number. Now this information will be found on the card or the fob itself. Um, so there's a three-digit number for the site code, and, and you can key that in, um, like let's just say it was one, two, three. Um, so you can key that in, and then you'll see a five-digit number on the card or fob. That would be the actual card number, and let's just say that it was it's, it's that. Um, so you can see here now I have this kind of odd-looking representation of, of my card or fob. Um, now, you may also have... A, a situation where you want to have an access keypad, say this is a commercial application and you want to have an access keypad outside that unlocks a door, um, you can uh, put PIN numbers in that um, using the same code calculator. The site code in that case is going to be fixed or programmable in the keypad and so you'll reference documentation there for that information. And then the PIN number would be what the user is going to put in to that keypad to get access, so you can use it for either one of those things. Once you've learned in a credential, um, it can have the same authorizations as any other user, um, like it, it could be an arm disarm bypass, like say this is uh, you know my, my fob that I want to carry around with me, it can have the same permissions that my code does, or if this was a commercial application and this was just to unlock a door, we could select only access here and pick the areas that you're going to have access in. Um, so that makes learning in those types of credentials a lot easier for you. You don't have to have a separate application or learn them in at the keypad. Now that is an option. Um, if, you, if you do want to learn them in at the keypad, that is something that you can do. Um, it, there's a menu in the keypad to allow that to happen. But if you're programming through the software, it's, it's, it's really easy to do it this way. Um, I, get, I see we're getting a lot of questions in about um, the type of readers and that sort of thing that you can use. Um, so the M1 is compatible with 26-bit weakened devices. Um, so that could be a reader or an access keypad with a 26-bit weekend output. That's what we're looking for. That can um, be connected either to a system keypad, a data bus type keypad. Um, the M1KP and M1KP2 um, both can accommodate that. Um, the navigator doesn't have a connection for a proximity reader. Let me go ahead and, and tell you that because I'm sure that question will come in as well. But um, the um, larger original keypads have that option as well as the KP2 keypads to have a reader connected to them. We also offer an access module, the M1KAM. Um, you can have a reader connected to it and it has a relay output on board for controlling the locking mechanism as well as a request to exit input and some other access based features. So if you are using it for access control, that's a good module to, to get. Um, you can have the reader more remotely located from it than you can a keypad. It ha with a keypad it has to be within like 10 to 15 feet. With the M1K M access module your reader could be up to 50 feet away. So um, just some you know different things to, to know about the, the readers and how that works. Now as far as cards and fobs are concerned, you want to get those from the same manufacturer you get your reader from. Even though we're going by a standardized 26-bit weekend output, that does not mean cards and fobs are interchangeable between manufacturers. So if you get an ELK reader, you want to get the cards and fobs from ELK. If you happen to get, you know, like an HID reader, then you want to get the cards and fobs from, from HID. Um, so you want to keep you know, within the same manufacturer to ensure compatibility because it's it's not guaranteed that an HID card is going to work on an ELK reader. In fact, it, it won't work even though the 26 big weekend output of the reader is, you know, a standardized thing. It's not, that that's the output of the reader and not a compatibility for cards and fobs. 
So hopefully that makes sense to you. Um, if you have more questions about that, I, I, I know I'm kind of generalizing there, but we did have quite a few questions there, so I was trying to hit, um, you know, kind of the, the high points to answer everyone's questions. But if you need to know something more specific, just contact Tech Support. I'm glad to see these great questions coming in. This has probably been the most active training that we've put on, Amy. I would say so. It's, it's definitely right up there. It's one, we have a very great audience today, so we, we thank you and keep those questions coming. Well, I'm going to go ahead and kind of switch gears here, and we're going to get out of talking about users. I'm going to jump down to areas and kind of expand that out. I'm going to talk about area one itself. Now, area one is what you can name like the main house if you want to. Um, so I guess I'll just call it main house. No, could be like the the pool room itself. Anyway, kind kind of way you actually want to to name it. Um, you've got two different entry exit delay times. So in case, let's say, the you're going to have a door that's not going to be close to a keypad, we want to have a little bit of extra time to be able to, to arm or disarm and go out that particular door. A good example of that. we got different arming options, auto stay mode after exit time of no violation. What that means, if you've armed up the panel in away mode, but you never left one of the perimeter doors, then the panel's going to be smart enough and resort back to a stay mode because it knew you didn't leave. It's a great feature for people that are just getting into getting a, a security panel that aren't used to that. Um, restart exit timers, so I'll keep panel for closing report, single key press quick arm or double uh, key press. I'm more a fan of a double key press because I am kind of clumsy sometimes and I actually try to arm up our system. I'm going to go ahead and do that. Now, earlier I did mention about all the different arming options that the panel does have. What we can do is we've actually narrowed it down. Default, you have stay and night mode. And basically the difference in between stay and night is stay mode, no interior motion detectors are active. None of them. In night mode, we can actually have certain motion detectors then be active. Let's say you've got a motion um, detector on one side of the house. You know, it's like the, the guest room of the house and then the hallway to it. Well, we want those motion detectors to be active because I'm not going to be going to the guest room in the middle of the night. I'm going to get up and go to the bathroom. It's probably the only place I'm going. We want those to be active, so in night mode, those two motion detectors would then be active. Instance means there's absolutely no entry delay whatsoever. Now, this little thing here is if we arm it up in the stay mode, and then I'm going to go to bed at night, all I have to do is hit the stay button again, and it's then going to put the panel in night mode for me. That's a really nice little feature there. If we need to make another area, so what we can do is we can come up here. We're going to highlight areas again by left-clicking on it. We'll then right-click. We're going to go through the exact same way as we were doing for users. Left-click there. How many do you want to create? What's the next number you want to use? I'm going to click OK. I'm going to use, uh, I'll just use copy from our last values there. Instead of the pool house or the pool room itself, we can call this, um, oops. You now have a man cave in your house, and it's on a totally different area. Okay. <laughs> Just trying to pick some different examples, because we usually do the same ones. I want to kind of think outside the box. So there's a good example, and, and then we can go back to areas. And the nice thing, if you highlight whether it's users or areas, it gives you a, a nice brief overview, kind of a, of a spreadsheet of, of exactly how things are actually set for you. Keypads. Now, you can have up to 16 hardwired keypads on a system itself. I'm going to go ahead and dive right in here to keypad one, and we can actually name these keypads. So this one could be at the uh, the front door, if you wanted it to be. So there's the keypad itself. You can assign the keypads to different areas. So we do have two areas here. We can actually assign those. Um, you've got different options of actually how that keypad's going to work. Whether it's going to be silent during entry delay, exit delay, no chime, LEDs off after 60 seconds and no activities, that's a great feature for bedrooms. And there's a lot of people out there that, you know, they, they like to have that room as dark as absolutely possible. And they, you know, they don't want those LEDs on. So after you arm up the system, after 60 seconds of no activity going on that keypad, the LEDs themselves are going to turn off. Now other people, like my dad's a great example, he likes those LEDs to stay on. He uses it as a nightlight. 
You know, everybody's a little bit different when it comes to that type of thing. Um, currently, the keypad is going to scroll across the date and time. It's also going to show the temperature. If it's the original keypad, the M1KP does have a temperature probe built into it. And it's also going to scroll across the area name. I think I called this one uh, the pool or whatever, so it's going to scroll across um, the word pool there. We can set the backlight beep tone and the volume itself on the keypad. And then uh, those programmable function keys that are located on the keypad itself, you can actually change these or leave them the same. Out of the box default, there's going to be fire, police, and medical. Um, you can invert the light. You can make the light blink. You can you know, require a code before it's going to work. So let's say if we had F4, even though it's disabled, there's no event, we can actually write a rule for that to be able to have access to, let's say, the seller. But we want to require a code before we actually make that work. So there, we actually kind of changed that one for you. So if we need to add another keypad, again, it's going to be the exact same process again. We're going to left-click on keypads, right-click, and then go through the same example again. And then we're going to have a, I'm going to make it be a custom value for our new keypad. And this one's actually going to be, I don't know, in the garage. If I spelled that right, my spelling's pretty horrible. Now you may you notice there's a couple of things on the screen grayed out here, like the show temperature and the F5 and F6 key. Um, until you connect to the system and it sees what kind of keypad is enrolled there, it's it's going to gray those out because, like, the KP2, the KP2 doesn't have those features, so it doesn't assume that you do. It, it it would assume that you don't, and then once you connect, it will change if you do have the KP keypad. Did that make sense? Thank you, Amy. Okay. Yeah, it sure did. I was okay. just about to say that, but you gave me a break, and I was happy. <laughs> All righty. Now let's get into zones, and we're gonna I'll go ahead and expand this out because I've been doing it the whole time. So. Why stop a good thing? I'm going to talk about zone one itself. And of course, I've talked about zone one being the front door. So I better type in front door. Now, the definition, the pergola entry exit delay one, or we can set that one to two if we wanted to. We can make it be a, a motion detector. Scroll down here. We've got all types of different options. And you actually have up to 34 different options of what particular zone or what it's actually going to be associated with it. I'm going to go ahead and scroll back up here to be that. The type is actually going to refer to how are we wiring the zone up. You know, is it a wireless zone? That would be the RF. Are we using that uh, resistor for end line being supervised? It's going to be a normally closed, normally open zone. End line short or open. So you have a lot of different options there of exactly how the wiring is actually going to work for you in the particular um, zone you're working on because sometimes it's just really difficult to get that contact there. What area is that zone going to be associated with? The attributes, you know, whether it's going to be a bypassable zone or not. Enable chime, is it going to be part of a cross zone pool? Swinger shutdown, does it require periodic trip, for example? You've got a lot of different attributes there. If we need to get into those, we actually can. I'm trying to kind of save a little bit of time so we have time for the what's actually really fun about the panel. At least what I think is fun. Now we can give this, since we do have chime, we can go over to a keypad and associate the voice with it by hitting just the chime button itself on the keypad. You can scroll through there, go from chime to voice only to chime voice and chime, and then um, silent. So you do have some different options there. And we're going to go ahead and pretend that the, the end user itself go ahead and wants the panel to speak. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go ahead and start typing in front. And you can see here, the more letters I type in, it actually goes ahead and brings that up. I'm going to go ahead and do that with door also. And you can see here, the more I type in, the easier it becomes. And we've got the front door is open. So now whenever the front door becomes not secure, it's actually going to speak. If we have a speaker connected to output one, the front door is open. If the chime's on, and that's something that you can turn on and off at the keypad. So the the voice part of the system is one of those things, if you enable it and you use it on every zone or every situation where voice could be used, your customer may get annoyed by it at some point. So um, that's something you want to give some 
thought when you're programming the system, where's the voice going to be practical and where's it going to be helpful? Certain zones you may want to know um, if they're open because maybe they're not visible or you know you want to know if someone um, opens your front door if you're in another part of the house, but you probably don't want to enable that for a motion detector you're going to walk by 10 times. You, you just don't want to hear that. So, um, you know, Keep that in mind when you're programming this. Use the voice in, in a helpful way and your customer will enjoy it and it will be a part of the system that, that they really like. If you overuse it, they might be annoyed by it, but um, the chime can be turned on and off at the keypad. Um, so if they want to have those announcements at one time, say they're having a party, they don't want to hear any of that because, I mean, people are going to be going all over the place. Um, you know, turn it off at that point. Um, you can also have the chime turn on and off automatically using rules. So there's a lot of flex flexibility there. Just you know, keep all these things in mind when you're programming the system so that you can make that a useful feature to the customer and not a nuisance. Great example, Amy. So you don't want it to be like my house where you constantly get annoyed by it, huh? Oh, I gotta go back and make a wireless zone. I was going ahead and jumping down to do that. All right, we're gonna highlight with left clicking. We're gonna right click. We're gonna come down to new wireless zones. Um, which group do we actually want to associate with? These are gonna be in blocks of 16. So maybe I'm gonna have uh, some hardwired zones from 17 to 32. So I'm gonna jump down here to 33 through 48 for my wireless zones. I'm gonna left click OK. It's gonna bring up zone 33. My mouse doesn't want to play nice today. So, of course, this could be like a wireless door window contact, for example. But what Amy would appreciate would she would like to have a key fob. She wants a wireless key fob. I want one of those nice two-way wireless key fobs. Exactly. So you know the status whether, hey, did it really get the signal or not? So, I've got Amy's wireless key fob. We're going to come down here. and We need to define this as a key fob. There we go. And I need to leave the type the same because you see here that the RF is there. And I'm going to switch and kind of go over to wireless setup. So I'm going to left click there. Whether it's going to be normally supervised, I don't think that's a good idea to have normal supervision of that, Amy. No, I'm going to take it with me everywhere I go and I'm not going to be home all the time. So um, I don't want that supervised because that will just per cause a trouble condition on your keypad that just doesn't need to be there. So key fobs should never be supervised. And also I can associate this key fob with you as a user. Now I know your user code is 001. So now if you arm or disarm using the key fob, it's going to log as you. Depending on which type of wireless product you're using, whether it's the Elks wireless product, um, Interlogix, which is GE, or UTC, depending on which name they're going by at the time, you can actually use um, the TXID numbers to be able to type in um, off the sticker itself all those digits and program the wireless units that way, or you could do manual enrollment using a hardwired keypad under um, Using the keypad, it is under menu 12. 14. It's 14. Oh, I was thinking 12 or 14. I knew it was one of those type numbers. If you're using the Honeywell Ademco series transmitters, you'll actually come down here and use these type of numbers. You want to add anything to that, Amy? No, I think that pretty much covers it. You, you can you know, key in your ID numbers. You're going to find that uh, on the label on the transmitter. If you are, you say you don't have those or you've already mounted the sensors, then that's when you're going to want to go through the key fob, uh, or excuse me, the keypad. Um, one thing that I would point out, if you are learning in your transmitters through the keypad, you do not want to be connected with LCRP at the same time. So disconnect from LCRP, go to the keypad, learn in your transmitters. Then when you reconnect with LCRP, you will be able to receive that information into the software. But you don't want to be connected with LCRP while you're doing that because that can cause some problems for you and you'll end up, you know, having to go back and do the work over again perhaps. And, you know, that, that's just something you want to avoid. So don't have LCRP connected while you're learning wireless transmitters in through the keypad. That's my advice. <laughs> It's always great to have good advice. We're going to go ahead and save that information. 
I'm going to jump down here to wireless setup. A little star here. I'm going to go ahead and make that a little easier to see and get rid of that. I'll left click that. Now you can see here, of course, zone 17 doesn't work for us, but if we come down here and look at zone 33, we can see Amy's key fob is showing up. It's not supervised, so it gives us a nice overview of, of how it's actually being uh, looked at over by the panel itself. And then we can actually get into key fob events. Now, how is a key fob actually going to function? You know, you've got four buttons on that particular keypad. We can use those buttons in a combination to have more buttons. And what do we actually want those buttons to actually do? So, so you're more familiar with those, I was going to let you talk. Okay. Here. Yeah, so say you want to set up a panic button um, on your key fob. You want to have a, a button that, you know, when you press it, it creates a police alarm. You, you can do that sort of thing here very easily. Like, say, let's button four, for instance, we want to have that be a police alarm. We can just go select that here. And now that button will respond as a police alarm when it's um, pressed. You can also have automation tasks assigned here. So let's say I had automation task one um, opens my garage door. So I could set that automation task here on this screen. Now you can also write rules in the system to say whenever key fob button three is pressed, do this. And if you're doing that, then you can just leave it disabled here on this screen and it will respond to whatever the rule tells it to do. So there's a couple of different ways of setting it up. So my rule of thumb here, you know, arming, disarming, panic type things, or task activation you can do from the key fob event screen here that we're looking at. Other things that you might want to do, you can write rules to do that. So you've got a couple of different ways to go about programming your buttons. Okay. Now we're going to jump down here, and due to time, I'm going to go ahead and jump down to Globals. Um, globals got a lot of information locating it. It's all kind of in different tabs depending on what you're looking for. Uh, time displays in 12 hour. Date displays month and day. We can change those if we need to in Fahrenheit. And currently our panel is going to observe daylight savings times and we're installing this panel in the United States. Now right now we cannot call into the panel and be able to control it. What I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of go over here and I'm going to left click. I'm going to allow the local and the remote telephone to be able to call into the panel and either arm or disarm it for example. I could turn on and off an output if I wanted to, just by being able to control it. That's the first step in getting that to work. I need to come up here to G29 through G42 special. I'm going to left click on that tab. And I need to set my rings until auto answer. What I'm going to do is I'm going to set that to about a ring or two higher than my answering machine. So I'll set that to six. And I'm going to set ring, hang up, and answer. Now what's going to happen is I'm going to call my house, let it ring, let's say twice. To be sure it rang once on my home's end, I'm going to hang up. I'm immediately going to call back. In under 30 seconds, the panel is then going to immediately answer the telephone line, and it's going to ask me for a, a, a user code. As soon as I punch that in, I'm then going to have access to be able to control the panel. So I can disarm the panel if I wanted to, uh, turn on off uh, an output, like I said earlier. New, um as far as like if you wanted to dial into the panel with the modem, I know that's not a very um, widely used feature because it's it's slow and it's kind of older technology, but it is an option if that's the only way you can get remotely connected to the panel and you need to make a quick programming change, you can do that. Um, but you do have to have these um, options that Jonathan just went over, the rings until auto answer um, and the ring hang up answer enabled prior to trying to do that. So that's just something to keep in mind. But again, that's not something that you'll probably run into very often since modems aren't very widely used anymore. Making me nostalgic for my dial-up AOL account. Really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now we need to program telephones. Um, since most of you guys are, are, are guys and girls, I, I should say that, um, I have monitored accounts out there. We want to be able to get this panel to make report in. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to left click on telephones. Again, it's the same way as we've been going over. I'm going to right click to bring up this box, left click on new telephone. Um, here, instead of me just making one telephone, I'm actually going to make three telephones I'd like to be able to program in. And click OK. You can actually have up to eight different telephone numbers the M1 panel can actually dial into. And my first one, I'm going to go ahead and call that one my central station. So I'll call it CS. 
number to dial, I don't know, some 888 toll free number here, I'm just going to make something up off the top of my head. Uh, maybe the account ID, I don't know, is going to be AF. There we go, AF0012. Uh, what format would I like to use? I'm going to go ahead and use, um, I'm going to try CF today. Dialing attempts is going to be 8. You know, what do I actually want it to report? And that's actually going to be for my first telephone number. I'm going to change gears here. I'm going to program my second telephone number. This is going to be my, I'm going to call it my CSB, which is my central station backup number. The number to dial is going to have to be different because it's going to go through a totally different, so let's just make this be a local telephone number in North Carolina. And I did make up that number itself. I'll go ahead and need to give this the exact same account number again. There we go. I still want to report and see it again. Dialing attempts is eight. But remember, this is my backup number, so I need to come up here and tell it. Whoops! That this is my backup number. There we go. So it's only going to use this if it can't make it through on the primary number. Now I need to make a third number. This is going to be Amy's cell phone. I would like to call her. Well, actually, the panel would like to call her. Apparently, I put a D in there, so we're calling your Sedell. You're in North Carolina. I'm going to make up your number there. Now, if I call Amy and give her a reporting format like contact ID or SIA, which is just going to be some weird stuff going on, I don't think you're really going to understand what the panel wants to know. I was actually trying to tell you, so I'm going to come down here and select voice message. So now the panel, all that other useless information drops away because we don't care about account number or or anything like that, and we're only going to dial you a maximum number of two times. Even if I try to click on this, I can't make it anymore. So what we can actually do is we can write an automation rule to be able to call Amy for whatever example we want to, and it's going to give her this message. It's going to say, please hold, please hold, please hold. It's then going to say the message, and then it's going to say press pound to acknowledge. Now, if Amy does not press pound, like it went to voicemail or I just kept ringing and she wasn't paying attention. Maybe she was on a tech support call and that was way more important than her phone call or her home calling her. Um, the panel is going to wait. It's then going to call back. It's going to give her the exact same information again, same way, and then it's going to stop. It's not going to continue to call Amy's cell phone repeatedly and drive her up the wall because she's going to look down and say she's got 40 missed calls from her home. What in the world is going on? So it's only going to call her a number of, of two times there. Now. For the central station, if I go back here to telephone one, you know we programmed all this information in. Um, that's the first part of getting this to dial into the central station. The second part is I need to come down here into the communicator side, and I'm picking on zone reporting codes, and I need to go in here and make sure certain zones are reporting in. Like right now, I've got zone um, 16 is set to program. But remember, I never programmed anything. I only programmed zone one, so I need to come in here and make this a zero, zero. Zero, zero means this zone will not report to the central station. But zone 15, all the way through zone one, will report because zero, one is programmed in for the alarm. Now, for Astorals, nothing is going to transmit in the central station. Nothing is going to transmit in under bypass because it's still zero, 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 one. But we are going to transmit troubles. So we can transmit those in the central station. Remember, anything that is 001 will report, 00 will not report. And that's going to work for the same. If I go up here to area reporting codes, it's going to be the exact same way. Like right now, um, alarm cancel will not report. Um, maybe I'd like to have an early open. I want that to report because this is in a commercial building, so I'm going to press 01 for that. Now, we kind of talked a little bit about that. If got a, does anybody have any questions about that, Amy? Um, I've been holding some questions until we got into the automation part. We've got a, a really good question I think will be a good rule example for us. Um, the only thing, other thing before we get into it, just uh, very quickly here I will show you. We had a, a question about programming the illumination event on a keypad. So um, for your keypad, um, and I'll just go to this one since it's more like the KP2 example with your F1 through F4, you can set those up to you know activate a particular event. Let's just say that this one activates my automation task one. I was talking about that opens my garage door. The illumination event can be set to follow the 
zone, the, the state of the zone that's connected to the garage door. So let's just say, for example, that's zone 2. So I'm just going to scroll through the list here until I find zone 2 state. Set that there, and I can even have that light blink. So now anytime zone 2, my garage door, is not secure, the F4 key is going to blink on the keypad. And so that, that's how you set that up. Very, very easy to do, and um, you can make a lot of use of that, um, you know, different applications that you might be wanting to do with some of your F keys. And um, so, yeah, um, Jonathan, just go ahead and, and, and go into the, the basic stuff, and then as we get into the rules, I've got a, a great example here based on one of the questions that came in. That's great. All right. So I'm, gonna do is I'm just going to go ahead and jump down to rules itself. So I'm going to left-click on rules because we are starting to run out a little bit of time here, and I still want to be able to get everybody's questions answered. So to be able to write a rule, I'm just going to left-click on new, and that's what I did to get this box to pop up. And a rule is going to assist of um, to trigger the event of whenever. And I'm going to go ahead and left click and show you the example of these can all trigger a rule. So we don't need to load any kind of special programming language. So right now we'll just take a time occurrence. So let's just say at sunset. And it can be plus or minus. And as soon as I left click on that, you can see we can make it before or after sunset. But just to make it easy, I'm going to say, all right, at sunset, I want to turn on a light. Let's say the front porch light. I'm going to come down here to then is what we actually want to happen. Control lighting, an individual light itself. I just want to turn on, let's say the front porch light is light one. I just want to turn it on and click OK. And there's our first rule. So the time the sunset is going to tell us to turn it on. And the light itself. There's only one small problem with that. I do not program sunrise or sunset. So let me take a step back here and go to sunrise, sunset and program it because right now you can see since this is a defaulted panel that there is absolutely no sunrise or sunset. So what I need to do is if I know the latitude and longitude where I am, I could program it in that way or I can go to select city. And since last time we did this, Hickory, North Carolina set, but just to make it fun, let's pretend that we're talking where I live. So I'm just going to jump up here to Alabama. And I live we passed it right outside Birmingham. I'm going to click Use These Settings. You can see I now have Latitude and Longitude, but I still don't have any time down here. Now look at all this red stuff. And there's a hand pointing over here. If I hit Calculate, Sunrise and Sunset has now been calculated for my panel. So when I come back down here to Rules, now the panel is going to know when Sunset is, and it's going to go ahead and turn on that front light for me. Now with this rule, I probably need a way to turn this off. So I'm going to say whenever. And I'm going to do this a little bit differently. Whenever I set the panel up to be armed in a certain state, I want to wait to night instant. Whenever I arm up area 1 into that, then I want to turn off that particular light. Turn off light 1. So now I've got a rule to turn on the front porch light and to turn off the front porch light based on the arms status of the panel itself. Okay. Um, the, the question that we had was related to um, earlier you were talking about the different arm modes of the system and how you could have with the stay key um, scrolling option you could have the system armed in stay mode and then just press the stay key and it would change over to night mode. So we had a person ask, can, can that just happen at a certain time automatically? Um, the answer is yes, it can. And Jonathan will show you how to write the rule to do that. So the, we want to write great. a rule to change it from to, to, to night mode at a certain time. And I would say we would want to check and make sure that it was in stay mode before we do that. Just in case it's <laughs> in away mode. You don't want it to change to night mode if you're gone or something. you know. So. <laughs> uh, it's a great example. So. What we want to do here is, um, since this is, it, it's a great rule, and I can see a, a lot of ways why we'd actually want to do this. Um, and the fun thing about writing rules is, is we can write them uh, in a lot of different things. So what we want to do is let's just go ahead and say, whenever the panel is armed in stay mode. So now we know that the panel is armed in that particular mode. I don't think that would be the best way to start. You don't think so? Because I really what don't. I was going to do is I was going to do it this way to turn around and do it at a time. 
Okay. How would you do it, Amy? Well, well, I mean, Amy and I think totally different than each other, so it's this is part of the fun. Since it is at a certain time that you want to switch it from stay to away, then I automatically think the whenever should be the time. Okay. That's when that you want way. to look at it. I, I'm, probably, I mean, I'm interested to see where you're going with that if you want to. <laughs> well, we'll see. I was just it because it's so funny because Amy and I have written rules together, and mine are always so different, but the outcome is is right, and that's what counts. <laughs> So let's just say, now I'm going to use myself as an example here, and usually, and I'll go ahead and call myself a fuddy dud, um, I usually go to go to bed, um, I'm usually trying to get in the bed, or at least, you know, getting myself ready to go to bed at, at roughly 10 o'clock. Now, I'm on Central Time, so I've already watched all the good shows go off at 10. So I, I'm good with that. So whenever, it's going to be at 10 p.m. at night, and... We can also specify this by certain days of the week too, just to kind of kind of add something to this rule. So I'm going to go ahead and pick Monday through Thursday. I want this rule to, to work for me because I might be out of the uh, most likely Sunday night too. So I want this rule to work on specific days of the week, and also based on that arming status that we were talking about. So I'm going to come down here. I'm going to pick that arm status of stay mode. So the panel. Now it has to be, it has to be 10 o'clock at night before this rule is going to work, and it has to be certain days of the week before this rule is going to work, and it also has to be armed in the stay mode before this is actually going to work. So there's three things must be met before we're going to go ahead and automatically arm up to night mode. Security mode, automatically arm to night. And I'm going to go ahead and pick both my areas, and we could do it immediately or we could wait a minute. Now, I'm going to go with immediate because I think it's cool. I would, personally, I would probably put a little bit of time there, maybe a minute, but I'm just going to go ahead and go immediately there. So now we've got a bigger rule, and I broke something. Leave it to me, right, Amy? So we've got kind of a bigger rule, and we've got some and statements before our rules are actually going to work. But we can also we go and kind of open this back up here. Let me uh, edit this rule. Bring it back up here. This is going to be my. Did I get the R in there? There. So let me make a note for that. So let me go ahead and do done with that. So later on, I can look at that rule going, oh, that's what that rule is doing. Because after a while, you're going to forget and you're going to have to go back here and try to dissect the rules to see what in the world's going on. Now, another rule that I like at my house is whenever. And this is going to be another time one. This is going to be at 7, 15 in the morning. I have trash pickup on Tuesdays and Fridays. So I need a specific days of the week here. Oops. Pick Monday. Tuesdays and Fridays. I need to go ahead and beep the key. Well, first I need to send text to the keypad. And I don't have any strings attached because I forgot to do that. Let's just say I got that done, and I also want to beat the keypad to go tell me to go look at what's going across the keypad, and this will remind me to go take the trash out on those particular days. So there we were, went ahead and wrote another rule. Okay, um, one more example, and then I want to get a couple of questions answered here um, quickly and because and, we're running out of time. But um, you, you set up a user in, in this system for me here called Sam, and I really want to know when Sam disarms the system. I want it to call me and tell me that. Great idea. I totally forgot about Sam. Okay, so you've got a next-door neighbor. Uh, maybe they're going to look out after the dog or, you know, the cat or something. And you want to know when they come over uh, and, and actually are, are taking care of your house, and you will just want to know when they disarm the system. So right now I'm going to say... Whenever the system is disarmed, and that's area one here, and the last user was, whoops, I'll go ahead and pick the last user, and it's going to be Sam. So that's the person we're actually looking, whoop, we actually want to know when they disarm the system. We then want to notify Amy, and we're going to go ahead and call her on her cell phone since we went ahead and set that up. There we go. We're going to go ahead and pick area blank. Uh, where is that one? Right below that. There we go. 
is disarmed. So now Amy's going to be notified exactly when Sam comes over and disarms her system. It's going to go ahead and call her cell phone. So um, there was a question that came in about the, this feature that allows you to um, call and, and speak a message. This is for general information for the user of the system and is not in any way tied to or related to central station monitoring. Um, so the question that the person had asked was about uh, if someone uh, does get a call like this and they press pound to acknowledge the call, does it cancel dispatch? Um, it, it doesn't because it's not related to that. Now you could have the system call your central station if you have an alarm and then say the customer may want to just be aware of that as well. Um, you know, central station offer um, notification features as well to let the homeowner, the uh, property owner know that something like that, that's happened. But you could have the M1 set up to, to call them and tell them that as well. But um, basically what I'm getting at is that this is not a way to monitor the system. It's not meant to be a replacement for monitoring. It's meant to provide general information to the customer. Um, so like they want to know if a per certain person disarmed their system or maybe you have temperature sensors um, on your wine cooler and you just want to know if that gets too hot or your freezer gets too hot or, you know, those, those kinds of things that uh, the, the the property owner would want to know, but that aren't like crucial to um, you know life safety or um, related to any kind of alarm. That's what we recommend this feature be used for. I want to take just a couple of minutes, if, if you have it, to stay with me here to answer a few more questions. Um, we've had a really great audience today and a lot of questions. I know I haven't been able to get to all of them, and we will provide um, answers to those for you in a follow-up. But um, just a couple of things I want to hit on here. Um, one question that came in was how do you set up custom words? Um, you, you can do the recording that Jonathan was talking about earlier in the presentation. That's done um, from the keypad and also using the phone that's connected to the phone line. Um, the phone acts as your microphone and the keypad allows you to pick which location you want to record that into. But um, so that, that's kind of how you do that, and if you need some more information on that, there's some information in the manual, or you can contact tech support if you need some help doing that the first time, or, or just figuring out where to go to do that. Um, but you do use a phone um, connected to the phone line as your microphone, and you have to go to a particular keypad menu to, to initiate that. Um, another question that we had, um, and, and this is a great question, and one I definitely want to address as, as we conclude here. Um, more in-depth training on the system. Um, we offer a lot of different training courses. We do this monthly basics webinar and then we also try to each month have an advanced subject. This month's advanced subject is going to be um, IP features of the system, so if you're interested in that, definitely sign up. But We record these webinars and we post them on our website um, so that you can view those at, at your convenience. So there's a lot of different subjects that we've covered. Um, we've gone into more in depth on these LKRP software, um, rule writing, um, and then integrating with other partners, uh, products, um, energy management type things. So there's a lot of different subjects that we cover in those webinar videos. So take a take a look at that. Um, we do have a hands-on training happening here at our corporate office um, toward the end of October. I want to say that is on the 23rd, um, October 23rd. We're having a hands-on training here at our corporate office. We're in Hildebrand, North Carolina. So if you want to um, come to that training, there's more information on our website about that. Um, let me just go back over here. Like I said, there was a lot of questions, and I know I couldn't get to them all, but we will get back to you in a follow-up. Um, I think that's about all that we're going to be able to answer today. We really appreciate you spending the time with us here. We want to uh, thank you very much for um, your interest in the M1. Again, there are a lot of other resources available online, or you can contact tech support if you have questions. I um, want to thank you, Jonathan, for doing a great job for us again on this training. You always do so wonderful for us, and we appreciate it. And I uh, hope everyone has a great weekend. Thank you, Amy. Great audience again.